All right, we are recording. What's up, everybody? Today we are. <laughs> I'm gonna break down what the. I'm gonna break down how to look at news. Okay, first of all, let's 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 position all this at one. We are humans, right? And we have families. We have children. We have parents. We have siblings. Uh, we have relatives, we have friends, we have everybody around us. And our job is to make the best decisions with that information, with whatever information we can get for the future. Now, our job, our number one job is to make that big macro decision on are we in the best country to live in for the best prosperity and the best outcome? Uh, are we in the safest location? Uh, will, you know, those are the first thing, you know, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, you know, your shelter, your security, all those different things are a, a big priority before you can even start considering of like which, which vintage of wine is going to be more useful, right? That's a decision that, that can only stand on the legs of uh, security, stability, uh, you know, comfort, health. All those sort of things you can't really and i'm not saying that that's how you should be you know, your your life shouldn't be judged on the, which you know which wine you buy uh but you can't get to those sort of you know like if if you don't know where your next meal is coming from the least important thing to you is like what that next meal is right it's just that you have another meal um so when we look at all the geopolitics the news the, the everything that's going on in the world out there, we want to we wanna have a perspective and, and we need to look at those sort of things and say, okay, is this stuff that's happening really going to change my, uh, my beliefs, my, my, um, my zip code, my area code, my, the state, the country, the language I speak, the currency I trade in, the products I sell, and for the most part, like 99% of, it, it, well, that's not true. We have a lot of people from international locations. Uh, but I would, I would say that for the most part, if you're, if you're where you're at and you're comfortable, then you've got security, stability, health, uh, wellness, um, probably access to good education. The fact that you have the internet means you have access to good education, uh, or otherwise you wouldn't be on this video with me because <laughs> you didn't have internet. So what I wanna get down to is, is, first of all, I'm gonna break down a couple of things and explain that um, you know things are, generally on a global scale, similar to what they have been for a long, long time. Uh, headlines are not what they seem. And I'll, I'll get into that. Uh, and then also let's get into, we'll get into um, kind of geopolitically where, you know, where threats in the world could end up being, could end up coming from, could end up uh, being an issue and what they could look like, but more importantly, what the biggest incentives are. And, and my big main focus is to understand incentives. And trust me when I say that if, uh, if I was worried about a certain situation, I wouldn't be just sitting idly by to deal with it. I have actively or would actively um, make changes to that. So let me juxtapose everything with the fact, with the idea of the, well, okay, let me, let me get this way. Um, the United States is the most important country and idea in the entire world. Everybody watches us and reacts to us. Now, again, I want to be sensitive to you international folks um, who, you know, I uh, might think of this as some chest pumping, like, yeah, rah, rah, USA, USA. And that's not what it is. Um, what it is, is just an objective, objective view of 
where everything is and, and where we, you know, what, what the world is, right? So when the United States catches a cold, the rest of the world gets the flu. This past last year was a, uh, was a, uh, a good example of the, um, of the, you know, there, there were, uh, there was a lot of social unrest in the United States still. Um, and show surely, um, we've had those sort of, you know, things in, in Colombia and, and Brazil and, 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 you know, in Europe and all these other things where people are like, ah, oh, inequality is this and inequality is that sure those pop up, but when the U S does it, everybody else responds to it as well. Almost everybody else. It's a big thing, right? Um, again, I'm not trying to be like, we're the greatest because of it. I'm just saying that, you know, we are the biggest economy in the world. Uh, we are the, the, um, we are the, this island, and that's why I have this up. We are this island that is protected by these massive oceans that are owned by the U.S. Navy. So, you know, this, when, when you start talking about things like China, well, they're landlocked, and their only, part, their only stated partner in the world is Pakistan. Okay, that's their only stated partner partner um in the world is pakistan which you know economically is is pretty insignificant and geographically um gives them access to the arabian sea uh but the u.s military is right here right you always have this india is is a little more hostile to china especially in the border regions uh the nepal situation is something to worry about now china had been cultivating myanmar uh, but that seemed to have fallen apart recently. Um, and then, of course, we have Hong Kong and Taiwan, which are, you know, Taiwan is, is a U.S. And a, a friend, friend, sorry, sorry, ally. There we go. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of signaling that China is going to, you know, invade Taiwan, um, which they may have some initial success by hit, doing a land a, invasion or something like that. But, you know, that pretty much brings the U.S. into bear. Now, sure, China is fairly formidable, but it, I'm sure many of you have, have heard of Thucydides' trap, uh, maybe the, you know, the, basically where an up-and-coming uh, new, you know, strong country is a threat to the existing superpower. Uh, and this was Sparta with, with uh, Athens, that's where the Thucydides trap came in. And we, what needs to be understood is what China is doing is for security. They're really worried that they could be blockaded with international trade. Because Japan, South Korea, uh, Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia, Australia, New Zealand, um, questionable on the Philippines, um, Indonesia, Singapore, certainly we have military bases there. Um, is all, we have military bases here, we have military bases here. Uh, so that's pretty much blockading almost all of, of the area right here through, through partnerships, through ability to land troops and station, as well as all the aircraft carriers, the subs, the landing um, LHDs, uh, LHAs, all the, all the, you know, that, that those are big firepower that can control that to the, to the, you know, to the North, they have Russia, which, you know, sure. But then Russia really doesn't have uh, a whole lot. You know, th this area over here is pretty much again, you know, how do you get out of there and, and do something, you know, how do you, how do you get to Siberia and then do something again with the U S blockade right there? Um, which leaves Turkey is kind of like the big opportunity that, that they have because they have Eastern Ukraine uh, and it seems Belarus, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania is kind of, um, they're, they're always playing that game. Uh, and the US has definitely moved troops into Poland. Now, those, those are the two big things that you wanna think about when we're talking about
uh, you know, who is the, who is the, the threat? And there really isn't a threat to the United States in a sense. What they are, what they do do, and, th and this is where the, the concern is to the Thucydides trap, right? The um, Destined for War, the Graham Allison book did a good one on that, um, which is China looks to like, of course they have to, they have to figure out how to secure their shipping lines, right? So they build a Navy. It's not like the US Navy, but it's a Navy. Uh, they have a massive amount of people, but they don't have any, um, they don't have any uh, institutional warfare knowledge, whereas the United States has the last 20 years for sure. Uh, we have, I mean, the last time I think China was really at war besides the, uh, you know, the, the revolution, the Mao revolution um, was against China and against, uh, and against Russia. And, and that was, those were, uh, I'm sorry, China against, um, uh, yeah, so that, and then, and of course, uh, Russia was, the, you know, a war, um, World War II timeframe, uh, and, and of course, Japan. But these were not global, uh, like, excursions, uh, you know, across land. Like, we, we moved troops into Afghanistan, we moved troops into Iraq, into, uh, uh, into uh, Kuwait, uh, into Saudi Arabia um into somalia i'm sorry ethiopia yeah somalia yeah i'm thinking eritrea what's up shoot <laughs> um and let's see we moved troops in in the same in in all that period of time we've we've ran one of the best uh naval landings in history uh up up in here in world war ii and we took down the japanese empire through the islands all the way up and took them down. So, you know, we've got the United States has, you, you can argue that's, that's somewhat institutional knowledge all the way back to World War II. Uh, but there were certainly amphibious landing since. It's something we continue to practice. Uh, and we certainly control the globe. Again, not trying to chest bump here. So um, I just wanted to like address what the threat would, it, you know, when China is building up a Navy and you, in, you know, like I, I shared a picture of the, one of the U S ships, uh, the, the CO and XO on the deck of the ship, taking a picture of a Jap or a Chinese, uh, vessel, like, you know, fairly close, um, shadowing them. Uh, that's really just China, you know, they need to figure out what's going on, right. They're, they're out there trying to figure out what's happening in the world. Uh, you know, certainly around Taiwan, certainly around Hong Kong. If we're doing, um, if we're doing uh, the, um, so there's a, there's a big military exercise we do in South Korea. We do one uh, in Japan, uh, in Singapore. There's all these different exercises that we do around the region. And we land troops constantly. We roll into, uh, I've, I've been to Hong Kong, Singapore, Thailand, Bali, Indonesia, Australia. Um, I didn't quite get to the Philippines time. I've, you know, I've been to Japan, but not in the military. Um, we hit, you know, this area, Honolulu, the Hawaii area all the time. So we can put even just showing up to buy goods in, in port is a massive stimulus to a local economy. Uh, and so, you know, everybody is always saying, you know, please land your 5,000, 6,000 U.S. troops into our port and come in and buy, you know, it stimulates our economy. Um, China, less so, uh, especially if they realize that, you know, by doing so with China, that may look like uh, they're partnering uh, with the Chinese military. They're doing something like that. So, but, but when we do these operations uh, in the mountains and, and in all these different areas, we're practicing working with partners. We're practicing working with uh, the Singapore military. We're practicing working with the South Korean, uh, uh, not Japan so much because they're not a military anymore, really. Self-defense force. Um, but a lot of it's working with these partner forces that are going to be doing a lot of our work anyway. And if we continue to give them our doctrine and you know, helping them in the training, that just makes this a little bit more isolated. Now, we're not trying to isolate China. We're just trying to say, look, you know, there's some, there's some current concerns we have with what you're doing here. 
And, you know, every, every step you take, we're going to take another step. The Thucydides, Thucydides battle, or, you know, um, the Thucydides, uh, I forget what it was called again, um, is, is basically that China builds up their military and the U.S. or partners of the U.S. are very much threatened by it. And that could, you know, create a, an escalation. And we saw that during the Cold War with Russia, with the Soviet Union, I should say. Uh, so, you know, everything from the stands, except Afghanistan, uh, down to Iran, Azerbaijan, uh, Jordan. Uh, this was a kind of a, you know, an interesting, Turkey was a, like a, a major battleground during the, uh, during the Cold War. Bulgaria, Romania, Slovakia, you know, the Czechoslovakia region. Um, you know, this whole thing was Soviet Union uh, with China kind of in or out. <laughs> uh, Vietnam kind of in, Russia made their way to Vietnam and, and Laos and uh, all those regions. But ultimately, what it was, was, you know, brinksmanship. We, we had a couple of confrontations that were uh, the, the, you know, Cuban Missile Crisis was one. Uh, where we threw the blockade, uh, they were, you know, they were landing uh, Russian missiles in our back door, right? And so we threw a blockade in and they had to, you know, they were steaming their way in, um, boo, doo, 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 steaming their way in and we had to throw a, a blockade or maybe they came another route, but it's not that easy how they get there, right? Uh, back then they could have come through Bulgaria, they could have come through Lithuania, um, or they could have even done that number. I don't remember what it was. And I've never really sailed with, sailed the, uh, this area because it's a lot of ice. So um, we had that. And then, of course, we had a number of incidents with, you know, missile uh, where they, there was a certain nuclear sub. And that, that was the, um, the hunt for Red October, I believe, was somewhat loosely based on the idea that there was a, uh, sub commander who was issued orders to launch because they thought the U.S. had launched nukes uh, and he didn't. And, and I think this happened in our on our side in the in the NATO side as well. Um, and I'm I'm generally leaving out the Middle East, so or I've left out the Middle East up until now, and Middle East and and Central Asia I should say, because Afghanistan is. Uh, we're, we're pulling out of Afghanistan after 20 years. Uh, still troops in Iraq, still in Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Israel, uh, Turkey, uh, you know, whether you recognize Northern Iraq as Kurdistan or not, um, definitely, you know, good relationship with UAE. Um, Yemen, there's stuff there. Uh, but so, I've, I've been posed the question of, you know, why is, you know, actually, what do I feel about the U.S. pulling out of Afghanistan? And I personally think it's, yeah, we should, like, our mission in, in Afghanistan was to, you know, in essence, after 9-11, was to disrupt the idea of a caliphate, of a, you know, a militant, dominant so maybe I'm, I don't know if I'm using the term correctly on caliphate, but when um, <laughs> uh, Zawahiri, uh, you know, did the, the fatwa against the United States and um, the West generally saying it's every, uh, you know, jihadi's uh, job to wage war, um, what our strategy, we didn't, we don't need, we've done our device, our um, decisive victory and harvested the needs uh, or harvested the the spoils of that in world war ii when germany was like just marching through the world just plowing through everybody uh and japan was kind of just very imperialistic right uh we took both of them down and with, with the coalition of course um the the uh the allies took down that and the US was able to benefit the most, especially during Bretton Woods. So 
now that we have that, our job is no longer offensive. Our job is no longer uh, to go and, and start wars around the world to conquer. Uh, because like it, Afghanistan looks nothing like we conquered Afghanistan. But what we did do is we disrupted the, <laughs> um, you know, the Iranian backed theoretically uh, caliphate, the idea that, you know, they, they would rule and, and Saudi Arabia and Iran do not see eye to eye on that. Uh, nor does Jordan, nor does Israel, which is its own battle. Um, Iraq, you know, we still have the largest embassy in the world there, and we're going to have a pretty big embassy in Afghanistan. Look who's right in the middle of that. Um, and, you know, one of our best partners in the, in the region right there. So we destabilized the, the uh, idea. We kept them fighting these little battles everywhere so they couldn't really get a good foothold on it. Granted, we did create jihadi warriors of grandchildren and, and all that. So there is that to deal with. But the more important thing is, is we didn't, you know, we weren't there to own Afghanistan and, and put a Starbucks on every corner. Uh, same with Iraq. Um, but we're there to destabilize the, the um, uh, that, that Islamic militant state. And fairly decently, but you know, the Iran is still the, the biggest uh, concern in the region um, from, from a US perspective, not from, a, um, from any other region, but the, the regime of Iran, not the Iranian people, the, the uh, Ayatollah, all those sort of things, and, and Hezbollah, and all the, all the stuff that they're doing um, around the region, uh, and certainly in Syria. So um, kind of a around the map view of what is known. Now, now a question will come usually like, what about, you know, a ground, what about an invasion of the United States? Well, um, it would have to, because we control basically all our borders, you know, and, and have shipping lines all the way through, uh, pretty much the best route would be through Canada. Um, so either you're going to have to launch ICBMs, air continental ballistic missiles to, you know, wreak havoc on the United States, which we have the iron dome, uh, you know, to shoot those down theoretically. Um, and then we have, you know, if, if, if those things did happen, you know, then a land invasion is probably not that exciting to a country who just, you know, uh, created a, a highly toxic environment, they're probably not too interested in landing troops uh, on a place like that. Short of a nuclear attack, uh, you know, a Mexico, so, you know, landing troops in South America and moving them up the peninsula in through Mexico and in is a lot less of a, a likelihood. Um, you know, it doesn't, this is a tiny area. And of course, Colombia is a major uh, partner of the United States. So if you're, you know, coming anywhere through, uh, you're going to have to move a lot of troops through the region, or somehow you're going to have to get a lot of troops into Mexico some way. Uh, look, not totally undoable, but a major invasion force? No, not, not possible there. Um, and again, the Navy handles, they, they own the seas, the US Navy owns the seas. And, you know, the other thing is, is everybody likes the, you know, since we are the, the global reserve currency, they probably want to have a pretty good relationship with the United States. Um, I think it was El Salvador decided to switch to Bitcoin. So that's, that's cool. Right on. Um, I don't, you know, that, that doesn't, <laughs> even if that, you know, uh, I, I don't think that really changes anything. Um, geopolitically, it's, it's, it's great for Bitcoin, but it's just, you know, not really that, that big of a thing. So hitting troops in the oceans, you know, hitting a, a vessel in the ocean is, is, a, is a doable thing, like what Japan did when they took down the U.S. fleet, uh, because the U.S. fleet was basically hanging out here, or the Pacific fleet, fleet was hanging out here. Now the Pacific fleet is everywhere, you know, from, um, from Jordan, to, uh, um, you know, we, I personally have been to Jordan, Eritrea, uh, Djibouti, uh, Oman, Qatar, Dubai, I'm sorry, UAE, 
Iraq, Saudi Arabia, um, Kuwait, not Saudi Arabia, Kuwait. Um, do, 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 do. So, so we've, you know, the Pacific fleet has a big pref, uh, a big uh, presence right in here, certainly. We know there's a big presence here. And the Atlantic fleet, uh, you know, right here is a, a major important thing. The med is obviously, they're called med floats and everybody wants to get on them. If you're on the West Coast, you get to go to Asia. If you're on the East Coast, you get to go to Europe. Um, okay, so I think I covered all of that of, of why the United States is uh, certainly, you know, somewhat objectively, the uh, largest economy in the world at 22 trillion. Uh, they have the EU itself, uh, the IMF recognizes the EU uh, at 17 trillion, but uh, one of the issues with the EU is you have, um, first of all, they just lost the UK. So the UK would be somewhere in the top five or six uh, economies in the world. I think California is in there as well, just FYI. Um, and the EU is no longer has their second, you know, the, the second biggest economy uh, after Germany in their thing. So now Germany has to deal with um, and, and we know that Germany has some history when they finally became a country, uh, even when they were Prussia and even before they, they very much, uh, were, uh, the rulers, uh, or, and the, the conquerors of Europe in their pretty, their DNA is pretty much on every battle. Right. Um, which is fine, except Germany, you know, this is, let's just say who, you know, EU starts with Italy, France, Spain, Belgium, Germany, Austria, uh, Netherlands, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Finland. I don't know about Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, yes, Czechia, what? Czech, sorry, Czech Republic, yes. I assume Slovakia, my wife's parents, uh, paternal family, uh, who are definitely not Hungarian, if you ask them. Uh, anyway, uh, all these different, all these countries are very unique, very, very unique. Italy is completely different than France and Germany uh, and Denmark, right? I mean, there, there's no doubt about that. In fact, their debt is basically, they're just using uh, Germany as a cosigner on their credit card uh, and just running it up. They're in, they're in a lot of debt. Spain has a similar problem there uh, with that. Um, you know, France and Germany have to kind of fund the bill now, and especially after losing the UK, who, if they're not going to have a partnership over here, who are they going to have a free trade agreement with? The five, uh, the five eyes of intelligence have a open, basically, we share our intelligence and you share your intelligence, and it's pretty much just done. There's no, uh, there's, there's very little negotiation. And those intelligence agencies belong to the United Kingdom, Canada, United States, Australia, and New Zealand. So we're basically the, this major strong coalition that can see each other's intelligence and work together on operations globally without much effort. Occasionally there's some, you know, a little negotiation to make something happen, but all that um, is there. So by losing the UK, you know, Europe has its own situation. Europe is going to do partnerships with, uh, you know, one of their concerns is, is going to be a, you know, as, as uh, Russia continues to Influence right now. You're currently seeing the influence in Belarus with uh, Lubashenko, uh, basically doing um, you know illegal elections and not leaving office. And uh, they they returned a Ryanair aircraft uh, to uh, to to put somebody in jail. So there's a lot going on here, and that's going to have uh, the EU's attention. NATO, um, Warsaw Pact. Hey. Uh, and the U.S. is very heavily involved in just making sure that it doesn't get too far into the region, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't move too far. Again, Russia, we have to think about what Russia is doing. Russia is not trying to conquer, 
but they're sitting here with, you know, like NATO right here on their borders here. Uh, NATO, like we're in Afghanistan, uh, you know, NATO right in this area here. They've got China who is hostile or not uh, and nothing else. So they need to basically, they're, they're, you know, they could be, they could be attacked over in this region easily by the US or, or Europe or you know, anybody. And certainly China could you know, come up. Um, and so what they're looking to do is they're, they're looking to get a good buffer on Moscow, St. Petersburg. Um, the distance to NATO used to be like all the way over here. Uh, and now it's, you know, we're right here, Latvia, Estonia, Finland. So, okay. And, and certainly every single country has their own, in, there's not just the EU where everybody agrees to everything everybody does in the EU. You also have, much like in the United States, you have a state who has a plenty of power, right? So um, France, they're, you know, yes, they are a big part of the EU, but also they're gonna do what's best for France. And it's always gonna be a battle where they're always gonna, you know, Yes, they're going to give, they're going to get, they're going to negotiate all those other things. Um, but it's not going to be very, uh, I mean, look, they got rid of these guys. They got rid of the UK. Uh, they're not even going to have a free trade agreement because they're going to get a free trade because that was part of the whole reason to get out of the, or the, you know, the EU, uh, you know, part of the reasons. So, uh, you know, getting a, a, a free trade agreement with the United States is going to be fantastic for the United Kingdom. Uh, it's going to be frustrating for mainland Europe. <sighs> okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the mo biggest headliney, but the least, well, the little amount of influence that the U.S. president actually has in the United States. Around the world, the U.S. president has a lot more influence than he has in the United States. Now, when I say influence, I, I, don't, I don't mean it in the way that, you know, he can tweet something, they can tweet something, and that's gospel, because that does happen in the United States. But every, there's constantly illegal, like not illegal, but uh, that, you know, constitutionally is not legal to happen. You know, and we saw a lot of that with with uh, Trump, is he would say something, uh, and but it couldn't. It, it isn't something that he could do. Uh, and and in fact, you can see uh, governors doing this all the time. The way the country, you know, the Federalists, um, the way the country works, that we don't have one supreme ruler dictator. That's it seems that way to a lot of people around the world and in the United States, but that's you know that couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, governors have immense power uh, over their state, but not individual counties. So, you know, our governor here, Doug Ducey, can say no masks required anymore, but the, the um, you know, the, the county, that the Maricopa County that I'm in, can say masks are required. And it supersedes because the government, the, the governor doesn't have the de facto uh, power over the state. Now he kind of, you know, he administers the state. He issue, you know, gives money to, you know, allocates capital to uh, different counties. Uh, can can you know, can declare a state of emergency and request federal aid. There's a number of things they can do, but they they can't be dictatorial, right? We are a republic, which means the government is a representation of the people. We are a democratic republic, meaning that you know. Uh, we vote for what we want. Uh, we vote the people in for what we want. So um, it's a little bit different when you see like, you know, the, the, the craziness that goes on this. And this is where we're going to get into the, before I do, I'm going to, I'm going to, well, yeah, let, let's first start with this. So um, one thing that's been consistent is, global policy on um, China, where we're looking to, we got to deal with China. That's a bipartisan issue. Uh, yeah, it, it got really heated 
uh, with the um, with the sanctions uh, because they were fast and furious. But Obama put sanctions on China. Obama also had dealings with China that were not they were declining because in essence, what the world thought we all thought was China is going to be a communist country, a communist capitalist country, I guess, if that's if that's the way to say it. They're going to grow. And as soon as they get big enough and a seat at the table, they're going to turn into a democracy. Well, that didn't work. That didn't happen. Uh, that was the thinking from the you know, 90s and early 2000s. And then it became clear that China was going to continue to do the things. Uh, you, know, you have your human rights violations. You have all these different things that they were doing. And they say, OK, well, uh, we need to start dealing with China, who is undercutting our US labor force. Uh, they are putting our people out of a job. We've outsourced this sort of thing, thinking that it was going to work in our favor. It's not. Now we have to pull it back. So Obama started that process. Trump continued that process, and Biden continues that process. So that is a that's not changing. Russia certainly was on the outs in uh, through the Obama administration. Uh, and the Middle East, you know, we gotta we gotta close down, we gotta shut down operations in the Middle East, but we gotta keep you know the, our enemy destabilized. So you know, let's let's take troops out of there. Let's let's figure out what we need to do. And Obama, certainly the uh, you know the the drone, uh, most known for his not most known, but he's very well known for drone attacks uh, under his administration, I should say. But that didn't stop with Obama, um, and you know certainly probably not going to, I mean, it, things should change, but that's about it. So uh, in essence, nothing's really changed with China, Russia, and the Middle East um, and Europe. Like, you know, as there, there probably will be nothing to change with those China, Russia, and the Middle East and Europe. Um, it'll just keep being the US, keeping things in check, controlling the oceans, securing our, uh, our world, and, um, and things will grow. Now, there are some demographic issues that probably what we're going to see is a change in rhetoric on, um, on migration patterns. And I think this is going to be a global thing over the next 50 years or so uh, to where the border wall is, you know, certainly uh, Trump, Biden, and Obama, even Bush, uh, where th this is a bipartisan issue. They make it a partisan issue every time, but it becomes, I remember being in Mexico City back in 2005, maybe, and some lady just stopping me on the side of the road and just yelling at me, no wall, no wall, no wall. This was 2005, maybe 2006. So this was a Bush administration. Um, and and the, the H-1B visa thing was an issue. Uh, there, you know, there was a number of different things, but it's going to become a point in time where, you know, the world is not reproducing the way they were, um, 50, a hundred years ago. Right. So, um, there's going to be a basic, like <laughs> a way to motivate people to come to do things. And, and this has to do some, someone with, uh, the baby boomer demographic, because something that I've always pointed out, and this is one key component of understanding the largest uh, and the most prolific voters <clears throat> in in the United States are the baby boomer retirees because they are most affected first of all social security was built to pay out at you're supposed to retire at age 60 or 65 uh, and then pay out for a couple of years before you die life expectancy was like 60 two at that i think so 60 year old was social security and i was supposed to keep you alive for a couple more years well now people are living in their 80s 90s 100s and if they stop working in their 60s well uh, they're going to run out of money and so this cohort which is the largest cohort of voters in the united states is going to start voting and they're first of all like who is the incumbent leaders of the united states um you know, it's, it's baby boomers, the CEOs, baby boomers, the administrators of universities and, and large government organizations, baby boomers, politicians, baby boomers. Yeah, you've got AOC, you've got people who are younger and 
more vibrant and, and kicking it up and, and they will continue to do, and they will be a voice for um, an anti baby boomer um, movement uh, to counter the baby boomer movement, I should say, but they're going to be up against, you know, a, a fanatical voting. You know, if you don't have to go to work, you can vote in every single election. You can get out there um, and, and register in, you know, you can do every single thing. Well, if everybody's working, they're going to try to have to figure out a way to get time off to go vote. So when you start seeing things like, you know, no online voting, so that you have to go in place and you, know, you have to go do it. Well, who can, who can afford to do that? The baby boomers. And who, who's going to keep those laws in place to support the baby boomers? It's the people that the baby boomers are going to vote for. And so they're not going to give it too many reasons for people to, uh, you know, take the day off of work. You'll hear that, you know, what about a free day off or a paid day off for, um, to vote? Um, you know, businesses can choose to do that, but it's not going to be a federal regulation. That's, that's not how our government works. And so it's just, a, you know, built for that. So as this population start needing, you know, help, uh, nurses and uh, medical help and all those sort of things, we're going to have to import cheaper labor because it's going to be too cost prohibitive for somebody who's 90 years old, uh, who's been retired for you know 25 or 30 years already to pay for the quality care that a you know a 70, 80, hundred thousand dollar a year or a hundred thousand dollar degree at a university is going to you know accept as a salary. Uh, and so we look at bringing in other, you know, lower wage earners from different, you know, geographies around the world, just as educated, but not financially burdened with, you know, obnoxious debt from their education. So, it, it, you know, it's a win in the sense that they don't have a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars in student loan debt. A lot of them, if they do come, you know, probably won't have much student loan debt at all. Uh, and so they'll be able to, you know, earn less, but still live the same quality of life of somebody who charges higher, who has a higher burn. Okay. Um, and then I guess one last thing is I want to focus on is uh, that area is going to demand new technology uh, to help. We're going to need new technology to help service the baby boomers who continue to live longer, because one of the outcomes of living longer is you're sick longer, right? Um, from Alzheimer's, which yesterday, I think they released a, a new, um, not drug, but I, well, I, I don't know exactly what it was. I haven't done any research on it. And it's very important that we do, um, do we do understand biology? Uh, because biology is the new tech. That will be the technology that will be pushing the future. Uh, we will be moving forward through biology. What bits and silicon was for the, uh, you know, from the 80s on, the, you know, the next cycle will be a new technology, right? So the, um, pretty much from the, uh, you know, the, the first half of the century, the first, yeah, the first half of the century was about the automobile. The first part of the century was about electricity. The second part of, the, uh, uh, of it was the automobile. The third part of it was the expansion from cities. Uh, and the fourth part of it was, in the United States well, and, and around the world. And the fourth part of it was the uh, uh, well, technology boom. And those have some like 50 year cycles. Now we're getting into like Neil Howe, 80 year crisis and um, Stratfor's 50 year cycles, 20 years of not gonna look the same. Each 20 year looks the same. So um, let me get to the idea that what uh, and, and I'm going to parrot this one from Stratfor. So in the 1900s, uh, you know, Europe, England, the UK basically ran the world, right? They were still the superpower um, and they were going to continue to run the world. Europe and, 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 uh, the, U and the United Kingdom, I guess, or Britain, were going to run the world. And then, you know, 20 years later, they were just completely melted by World War I, right? Completely destroyed. Uh, in 1920, that was the war to end all wars. We we're never going to have another world war in history. Germany was conquered. They were never going to rise up again. We don't have to worry about Germany. 
20 years later, Germany's taken over the world. Um, at the beginning of 1940, uh, you know, Germany, they're going to take over the world. Uh, they're going to dominate the world. They're going to take everything over. And, you know, we're all going to start studying German. And then, you know, they get beaten 1960s. It's the big boom from the baby boom. Uh, the automobile moved everybody from the um, urban centers of, of um, the United States to the suburbs because we had automobiles, we had shipping, we had electricity. Uh, it was this massive expansion and, and kind of, you know, by winning that and becoming, you know, the, the global reserve currency, we had a lot of opportunity. And so we spent few years after World War II. It wasn't immediately after World War II. There was a bit of a depression that happened then. And, you know, that's when the biker gangs kind of came out and all that. Anyway, in the 1960s, it was that, you know, nothing can change. Everything is the great, greatest time in, in the history of the world. You know, it was convertibles and fast cars and good music. Um, uh, and this was, you know, the United States also civil rights and we had Korea. So a lot of people think of the 1950s and 60s as like this early 60s as like this euphoric time, but there were other things that were happening. And so, you know, between 60 and 80, you basically got into uh, from the late 60s on, you know, the, if, if you wanna sit here and think that the United States is at its worst that it's ever been, certainly looking back at the civil war was a good example of not, uh, of much worse than now. Uh, you could look at uh, the Luddites, you know, the, the riots when uh, technology was, you know, factories was coming in to take out farming and all that. Um, but, but more importantly, I mean, there were full on assassinations. The US president was assassinated. His brother was assassinated. Martin Luther King was assassinated. There were um, uh, uh, extreme liberal, militant liberal, liberal groups in the uh, United States who were uh, bombing. There were bombs like daily. They were attacking politicians. They were killing people in the streets. It was political chaos, way different than what we're seeing right now. Um, and then, you know, then we had the stagflation. We had oil prices shoot up. We had the, you know, Jimmy Carter basically kind of uh, had to deal with that. The, the Iran uh, um, hostage crisis, 1979. You know, looked like a pretty, especially you know, 1979. It looked like a pretty bad time, and then uh, Reagan comes in, and technology kind of is he spends, which creates technological advances, which gets us into you know, the 2000s and the beginning of 2000. Like we didn't think, nobody thought there would be war. Nobody thought that in 2000, 1999, 2000. I mean, we had spent. The last time we had really, other than Desert Storm, which was a few weeks, Vietnam, like nobody was interested in another Vietnam. And so, uh, you know, in 2000, trust me, I was in the military from 95 to 99. Um, all they did was downsize the military. There was no need for a big military. We needed to downsize it. There was no World War II. There was nothing else. And then a year or two after I got out, boom, we're back at war. And we're at war for the next 20 years. So now... We're at this new 20 year cycle. And what is it that everybody thinks is never going to happen or is inevitable to happen is likely what's going to change in the next you know, 20 years. Okay, anyway. Um, I've been moving fairly fast. <laughs> so let me bring it to now in 2000-ish, 2004, I go to work for the US government uh, in, in the State Department. Um, and even when I was in the military, uh, there were secret, top secret things that were, you know, that we had access to as part of our job. Um, and this also will spin back to the, the president as well and government and media and everything like that. And the FBI yesterday doing their thing. but. What we don't see, what, what, what you don't understand is that it is a felony for if you have a clearance and you get, you get read on with certain information. Now, just because you have a clearance doesn't mean you get access to information. 
just because you go out and get your top secret clearance, you do the whole rigmarole, doesn't mean you can just like call up uh, the DNI uh, Department of uh, uh, National Intelligence and say, hey, get me this file. Let me know what's, tell me what's going on here. That it doesn't, just like any, anything, it just means that if you were brought into an operation or into uh, planning or analysis of something, that you are at the minimum level to get top secret if there is a need to know. So if you have a need to know of that information because you're part of the, the, you know, the, the assault team, the planning team, the, the command team, uh, the, the surveillance team, or you know, the, 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 lawyer, the legal team, if you're involved with that, in that particular real reason, there's literally a person in those units whose job is to determine if there is a need to know of everybody uh, or who, right? So um, a lot of things that you get, and, and the president has the ability to pretty much give anybody the ability to have need to know. Uh, they can read people in. The president doesn't even have to go through a background investigation to get his, his clearance. Nobody has a higher clearance than him. He can actually call up the DNI and get whatever intelligence he wants. That's, that's interesting. Um, but I guess that's what's required to administer uh, the country, kind of the world. <laughs> um, and so a lot of times you're going to be given, the media is going to be fed information or people are going to share information that is untrue because you can go to prison. You can be brought up on ch charges of treason. Uh, and during times of war, treason, the uh, murder or uh, uh, death, the death penalty is approved in times of war for treason. So, and, and I don't know how many of us uh, have too much legal background with U.S. constitutional law, but, uh, and, and constitutional proceedings, or, you know, legal proceedings, but basically what they do is they're, you know, they're going to go for the biggest thing that they can get. And if they can negotiate it down, then, you know, fine. So if you share something and it interferes in an operation, especially if somebody dies or further, you know, things happen, well, there's going to be a pretty good, uh, a pretty good reason for them to say, uh, you know, this is treason. And it's if it's during wartime or related to wartime type operations, keeping causes of the war, um, you know, you can you can be uh, capital, you can receive capital punishment. So they take it very seriously. Uh, when you get when you do your clearance, it's not pretty much like, hey, um, are, are you honest? Well, yeah, I'm honest. Are you lying? No. OK. Uh, the way they do it is. They basically. It's an investigation. So you give them a bunch of things to investigate, like you know where you went to school, where you lived, people you knew, courses you took, um, friends you had, uh, jobs you had, um, you know, like just these different areas. And the investigator takes that and goes investigates. Um, the first thing they're going to do is run a, a back a criminal investigation, right? So if you, you know, depending on if you've ever had a, um, any sort of criminal action, that's where they're going to start. If it was a felony, sorry, you're not doing anything. Um, but if it was, so the difference between a felony and misdemeanor is, you know, let's, let's just say that a felony, instead of getting too far into it uh, for all our international audience here, a felony is really, you're going to prison, not jail. Jail is kind of like you're waiting to, um, you know, you're, you're prosecuted by um, you know, the local people and you spend time there. Uh, prison is where, you know, the really big criminals are, uh, the long-term people are, and that's where felons tend to spend a lot more. They're, you know, pretty much everybody who's in prison is a felon. Um, misdemeanors don't really go there. So you lose your right, your voting rights, right to carry, uh, right to, uh, so you can never vote again with a felony. Uh, you can never own a firearm. Uh, there's a number of things you can't do if you have a felony least of which is be work for the US government, whether in the military or any any other way. So um, the risk of being a felon 
your credit risk. Basically, you're not able to get credit anymore. I mean, it, it kind of impacts your entire life getting a felony. So um, when somebody comes out and says something, uh, they're probably going to be hedging what they're saying unless they know what they're doing and they, there really is a good reason to, to say it, you're probably not going to be getting the truth or you may be getting 10% of the truth. So I've kind of, ideally what I've done up till now is I've positioned the world geopolitically, positioned the world of hopefully um, who's, you know, like, are there real major threats of World War III? I don't think so. Maybe there are. Again, we're at the beginning of a 20 year period. Who would have thought um, we would have had COVID um, a year and a half ago? Um, so now, also, when I, when I use the, when I talk about, uh, you know, if you're using the news and the media as truth, well, you're not, the media isn't getting the truth. They're getting maybe a version of the truth, but also have to understand that politicians, the, you know, especially the, the leader of the free world, let's say, you know, the, the president is always negotiating and always, it's always in some sort of uh, negotiation or, in, well, well, put it this way. What the president says and what the president does are two different things. What, what the government says and what the government does, two different things. Usually, by the time it's getting you know, thrown out there, they can't share a lot of their, like they're not gonna tell you their strategy with, with uh, China or their strategy with Iran or their strategy with Russia. They're not gonna tell you, Chris Dover, random dude uh, in, in Arizona. He's not gonna tell you what he's not gonna tell Putin. He's not going to tell us what he's, you know, obviously not going to be telling uh, Xi Jinping. Uh, you know, it's it's so getting heated and 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 really like blown out of proportion or, or just like going nuts on what uh, a politician says or a government official says um, is is the media getting clicks right they're they're getting their um you know they're getting their money's worth out of you um because you know they, telling if, if they came out and said well he said this but it's obviously not true because you know he can't or they can't share this information because it's illegal well that's not going to really sell uh viewership right so they have to come in and do some sort of analysis. They, what was said, okay, cool. They give us a, a sound bite. All right, let's go run it and let's and analyze this with a panel of you know, four uh, non-biased or you know, four different views. We have somebody from the, the Trump administration. We have somebody from the current Biden administration. We have somebody who was in, in the Bush administration. And we have this person at, uh, at, from Harvard or something like that, from the Kennedy School at Harvard, right? So not so much spin, it's uh, maybe, but what it does is it becomes their job is to try to figure out, I guess spin, their job is to figure out how do I get the most clicks, the most viewership on this story? And then how, does this, how do we become the, uh, the, the source that everybody links to? Because we're going to sell traffic to our story video, uh, podcast, uh, news article, whatever, uh, we're going to get traffic. And, you know, what does traffic? I'm just going to go to CNN.com. Um, I should get a web blocker thing somewhere up here. Um, oh, nope. Outmarket your competitors. Uh, you want to buy Sitka? Outdoor gear, cool. Um, check these out. And these are, this is uh, um, Outbrain right here. This is uh, avocado solid wood made in USA furniture. So, you know, if I want to, um, you know, if I want to get traffic 
I'm going to go and do something like this, something like that, you know, somehow that's going to be clickbaity uh, on a, this is an ad. Um, you know, somehow, some way, and if they don't have a whole lot of ads on there, why is that? What does that mean? Well, that means that this right here, they're going to pay five bucks. They're going to pay five bucks to uh, get some sick gear is going to pay probably five, 10, 20 bucks for you to click on this nerd wallet's going to pay a bunch. So, um, but you know, it's, it's definitely, that's their job. So let's click on, uh, investigative fan capital. We're warned about other embarrassing crunch time. I hope that doesn't, I should have done this on, um, there we are. Here's my ad again. Uh, uh Oh, looks like you're using the ad blocker. So allow now i have to go and disable it right so get out of my hair um so i know that you know it's it's a conspiracy that oh they're just you know it's just ads and all that sort of stuff but it but it goes further um and so reporters are their their big business is getting enough followers on their twitter because that gives them negotiating power uh, with a Bloomberg, with a CNN, with a Fox, with a um, CNBC, with a, a New York Times. Like they can get hired by the New York Times because they've got you know 150,000 followers and they created this link, this their own article and it went viral, all that sort of stuff. They get hired that, that way because if you can, ultimately what New York Times, what everybody's looking to do is get traffic. So if they can get the reporter that can do the right sort of writing or the right sort of uh, reporting or storytelling uh, that that will increase their traffic by X because now they're going to be part of the platform and that will increase all that. So that's, that's kind of one thing that we need to um, look at when we're, when we're seeing this sort of stuff. So if we, rather than um, looking for news to give you what's happening, Think about the bigger picture. Think about what is actually a reality, right? United States and China going to war. Like we'll see stuff happen before we realize that it's too big of a situation, that it is inevitable. Maybe if that actually happens. More than likely, I think Mexico is going to ascend quite dramatically um with the and and canada with the bennett but uh more canada has a free trade agreement well ish a pretty good agreement with the united states uh, on trade mexico not uh, well yeah mexico okay but like it getting your citizenship or work visas in the united states is a little bit harder um but as i mentioned they will there will be as the baby boomers start uh growing uh and demanding services, there will be a big outpour of Mexican, uh, and not just Mexican, but but certainly because they're the closest uh, workers who will not require as big of a uh, salary to repay student loans and all sorts of things. Um, and they'll fill that and that will in turn increase US tax revenue and that will piss off Mexico because they're going to want that tax revenue. Uh, and so that will kind of inflate things over the years, if that, if that happens. Um, and I'll, I mean, also just, it's, it's actually really surprising living in Phoenix. Um, I lived in, in Southern California for a while, uh, and I lived in Mexico for a while, Colombia as well. Um, but living in Phoenix, the, you would think that the Mexican influence in California would be just as broad, and it's not. Um, like there's a lot, I feel like a lot more real Mexico influence in Arizona than I ever saw in, in California. Um, like I, I actually speak Spanish a lot more here than I ever did in California. Um, and, and honestly, the, the, the quality of the food, uh, is, is even, uh, better, more close to what I had in Mexico than what I ever had in California. So um, anything, anyway, so, but again, let's take the, um, let's take the, the big picture here and let's run these things through a filter. 
is what is what's happening china russia middle east europe is that different than what's been happening for the last 20 years or so uh through the previous administrations pretty much the same thing china has ascended rapidly really rapidly faster than everybody thought uh so we you know at the beginning of the of the 21st century china was kind of like oh cool china is going to be a growth story and then it, you know we had the BRICS, brazil russia india and china well china <laughs> china ran with that um and then we had um so so there, there's those sort of things when you look geopolitically there's you know we're waiting for more things to happen paying attention to russia paying attention to uh china really not much to be said about europe europe's just going to sustain uh latin america there's a big uh uh liberal uh movement uh, I, I think i'm using that term correctly i think that's what it is or socialist i should say probably um i mean you've got from venezuela to chile now is doing their own new uh they're redoing their um constitution peru's in the middle of elections colombia is just uh, just melted up quickly uh their their president is not a <laughs> there's a flashpoint going on in colombia that's really scary especially with the border of venezuela so they're going to help ecuador has flipped uh from from socialist to to capitalist um brazil is crazy <laughs> uh and and so just things are things are a little kicking up there uh north of the united states uh again you know canada is pretty much going to be our bff um you know no i'm not i don't want to get too far deep into the canadian politics but um they're doing you know they're they're finally doing good with the with the um with the vaccine um and they're also doing pretty good with uh oil um being above 60 bucks a barrel that finally helps uh alberta um and then you know they're they're losing one of uh, of toronto's finest um so those are the big things that just always kind of run those filters to when you hear these sort of things now when you get to news headlines you're not going to get real news headlines. You have to think for yourself. They may give you a soundbite or an event, and you have to think through it. With the, you need to understand if you're in the United States, you know, definitely study law, study civics, understand that yeah, the the president can't just say this and it'll happen. It doesn't work that way in a lot of things. Um, in most things, there's two massive, massive uh houses that check the president well three uh you have the the house and senate these are two massively uh you know like everybody there's they represent every united citizen united states citizen right um and and then you have the judicial system which will uh overturn if somebody says no this is illegal this is constitutionally illegal or this is a, a uh you know against human rights or something like that and they'll overturn it a, a, a federal judge will overturn or a state judge can overturn you know depending on what the what the things are so they can implement things and it's you know very much uh something like that so um for you international folks it looks like you know a crazy nightmare uh has ended uh with with a new um from from not crazy nightmare but a um as as you know joe rogan put it like a, a coked out hooker is, is no longer in the office uh and and i yeah i honestly i don't really care about politics so i'm not i'm not judging uh I, yeah I'm, I'm not i don't do that against trump i'm just saying that the world had that perspective of it and of the whole thing and he just dominated the news cycle which is something that you know a president hasn't been able to do for a very long time um and so that that's what made him so polarizing and you know you, you have the calm and and what everybody kind of like expects of a of a us statesman with with joe biden right now in office um of course there's you know half of the country is like ready that you know biden's america they're ready to 
leave and you know take up arms and all those sort of things so it's still divided and that that's what is the united states we've this is we are unique we are we don't have to worry about the what the world's going to do we don't have to worry if portugal or spain or france or or england is going to invade uh like we did 400 years ago 300 years ago um we don't have to worry about China invading, Korea invading, you know, Brazil invading, uh, Germany invading. We don't have to worry about Russia invading. We don't have to worry about that. So all we have to worry about is ourselves. And so it seems so much worse in the United States than it actually is uh, on the headline side because they need headlines. Uh, Thomas asks, are there any public, publicly available sources for high level geopolitical information commentary that you trust? Commentary. Um, I read mostly uh, for my stuff. Um, I read, you know, Greek history, Roman history, uh, Byzantine, um, uh, kind of the Enlightenment, uh, Austro-Hungarian, the, the British Empire. Uh, I, I read a lot of those sort of things to, to you know, kind of get an idea of, of how everything works. Um, and then, of course, uh, I, I study law. I study uh, a really, really important thing. And, and here's one point that was... Um, it, 2000 or 2020 was kind of like the effect of a world war. It kind of, even though there weren't like shots fired with the war, it was very similar to what a world war was like. And the, the you know, the enemy on this one was, was biological. And so for me, it was very important that I understood my enemy and understood not only the enemy, like what were the, what are the, the, you know, mitigations? And it's actually, because it's, it, it's not hard. It just takes time. Biology is hard. Uh, molecular biology, cellular biology, biology in general is hard. But we were, in my mind, we were at war and I needed to understand what was, um, what was actually at stake, what was doable and what wasn't. So, for example, the, um, the, the vaccine. Well, a lot of people are talking about, you know, it, it, uh, uh, all these bad things that happened to the vaccine. And, you know, if you, if you don't know how it works, then you're going to get, you're easily caught up in hyperbole. It's easier to get caught up in hyperbole and conspiracy theories than it is to, take the time to get a freaking biology book uh, and, and you know a dozen biology books and learn about DNA, RNA, um, infectious disease, um, you know, uh, and, and how those all work, right? That, that's hard, that takes a lot of work. Um, you, can, you can outsource that sometimes to smart people, but what the, all that should be, that shouldn't be, oh, well, uh, I'm not going to call myself smart here. Uh, let's see. Uh, who's the, there's a dude on CNN that's like a doctor or Dr. Drew or something like that, right? Um, Sanjay Gupta, I think is his name, um, or Dr. Drew or whatever politically charged news source you choose, whatever. Um, you know, they say this is good and that's good. And then you like, oh, okay. And then you see your sister on Facebook talking about the reproduction, you know, the, the, it affects reproduction and, you know, you'll never be able to have babies if you have the, the, um, the, the vaccine. Uh, and look, it's, it just takes doing the research to figure that out is true, if that's true or not. I'll tell you for me on all my research, and I spent months on it, I didn't just, you know, just kind of like passively take the information from whatever news source. I went and learned a lot of this. I, it, so this is kind of the thing about war is that you understand when it's really important to know something. 
you're really good at gunfighting, but guess what? If the new war is different, you have, as a warrior, you have to take up arms in that war. And for me, taking up arms meant getting, taking cellular biology, molecular biology, studying DNA, studying just biology in general. I mean, I, I don't know how many textbooks I went through, uh, how many courses I took, uh, how much research I did, how many papers I read to come up with what, okay, now I understand what, how mRNA works, what RNA is, what DNA is, how a spike protein attaches and infects and, and, and all these sort of things. Look, I'm not saying I'm a doctor, but it is a requirement of a warrior to know your enemy and know your battle. And if you're going to participate in the battle, you better get out there into it. Now, I'm not over here to tell you what to do about vaccines. Um, I know what I did. I know what I recommend everybody to do that, that I interact with. Um, uh, and, you know, if you want to know, I'll tell you, but it's, it's pretty much, uh, you know, everybody has the tools to figure this stuff out. It's not a, uh, it's not like Fauci, Fauci isn't the only person in the world who can like learn this stuff. You, you can get a fairly good understanding. And then of course, you know, like take in podcasts and videos and, you know, commentary and things like that to help maybe lead you down a path of research. Okay. To answer that, I don't really, um, I guess, you know, again, back to those books that I read, um, they're useful, but on a, on a news um, let's see, on a high level geopolitical information commentary of interest. I use Stratfor, S-T-R-A-T-F-O-R, uh, for a lot of my geopolitical news, uh, or, or geopolitical, uh, thoughts. Not that they're the answer, but they, they're great to get, um, to watch. Another thing, I have a big map behind me. I always want it when something happens, I want to look at the map because the maps usually, that's why I have a map up here because the map will usually give me an idea of where, you know, what the story really is like, okay, you know, what shipping routes or where, you know, why is, why is Turkey so belligerent or why is Turkey doing this, that, or the other? Well, the Syrian war is happening there and then Russia is moving into Bulgaria and, um, uh, I'm sorry, into Belarus and Ukraine, which is the other side of the sea. Uh, so a lot of that stuff is, is more of like thinking through that. And again, thinking through law. We have 50, 50 United States here. We have uh, the, plus the DC. Um, we have 50 different legal structures uh, for state and local. <clears throat> uh, and we have a constitutional law. Um, so all that stuff is really, really important to learn. You can learn it. You can absolutely learn it. It doesn't need to be, well, I didn't go to law school, so I'm not going to do that. You can easily just spend 30 minutes a day on things and kind of just like get, figure these things out. So I don't know if I, Strat 4 is useful. Um, I think reading uh, Dalio's work on the great deck cycle is, is really good that probably gives you a, a, a good understanding of how it's all playing out. Don't, doesn't mean you have to fall into Dalio's alarmist uh, interpretations of everything. You can, but uh, that one's, he's pretty good at that. Um, so like yesterday, when let's talk about the, uh, let's talk about the uh, FBI, seizing the Bitcoin. Um, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I, his, his specific, Bob, his specific stuff, I don't really pay attention to, but his, his big debt cycle, his book uh, is good, is useful to read that sort of stuff, to understand how all that works and how that plays in. Definitely, I do, okay, so the ultimate point here, Thomas and Bob, is I don't outsource my thinking to any one person for a or a, a trusted source, um, I, need to know, I need to know what incentives are. And if I understand what the incentives are, then I can understand what the, uh, what the world is, uh, what's actually happening and whether it's relevant. So for me, um, if I was worried that the United States uh, was uh, 
you know, in, in a, there was a legit opportunity for a civil war. Um, I, I kind of think that that's pretty much everywhere else too. So getting away from it, I don't think is, is a, um, is a thing. I, if there's a civil war here, there's probably a civil war in Europe. Um, that would, you know, Moscow would stomp a lot of places. China would stomp a lot of places. So it's just all those sort of things. Okay, Thomas, uh, less of a focus on day-to-day -day headlines and more building foundational knowledge to help put pieces together. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Destined for War is a pretty good book uh, talking about uh, Thucydides' trap, which is relevant to US and China. I think that's an okay one, but it's it's mostly China, um, mostly Chinese uh, like headlining. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if that's actually a, as good of one. I think um, Henry Kissinger does a had a great book. Um, let me see, where's it at? Um, let me find the name of it. So the state or something like that. World Order. It's called World Order by Henry Kissinger. Um, let me see another. You know, I read John Bolton's book, The Room Where It Happened, and um, I, I mean, he's he's very politically charged. So I just I read it and kind of it gave me a little bit of a of a insight into like just how not important the office is. And that there is a big, uh, there is a big call to service in government. Let me actually, let me do this one real quick. Um, so I was in the military and worked for the government from 1995 till 2012. Um, so 17 years, um, which meant that was uh, President Clinton, President Bush, President Obama. So I had three uh, presidents and uh, probably six to eight um, House and Senates. Um, you know, we had, you know, the global financial crisis. We had uh, the housing boom. We had the 9-11 uh, and the recession after that and the dot-com bubble. And we had the big accession from uh, in the Clinton years, the technology boom. Um, so I, I experienced all of those. And while it may seem that um, the military folk or government folk are just like all on one party, they're really not. Like you, one thing I will say is like, there's no when, like, yeah, I might've had a political belief here and there, but it didn't affect anything I ever did in, in my job. That's because I had no impact in it. And like, I, if I wanted to, I would have gone to Congress or something, you know, uh, I was there to do something else. Uh, a great book from um, General Mattis is uh, Call Sign Chaos. I, I can't recommend this book enough. It is probably one of my favorite books of all time. And the reason is because when he was a Marine like me, uh, well, not like me, he was a special Marine. <laughs> Um, he was a very special man, uh, being a general and I was a corporal. <laughs> so yeah, he's, he did a little bit better than I did. Um, but what you really see is you, you just look through that book, you see no partisan there, there's no partisan politics. There's nothing in, you know, even as, even as a general, there was, you know, no, he had nothing in there saying, well, I'm going to do this because the president does that. Now there are some generals that as U S citizens, um, can choose a political party. Everybody as a citizen can, but I will say this when you're in the job, you know, there's very few people who are, um, you know, not going to do something. They're not going to follow their, their platoon commander's orders because of who the commander in chief is or who their Senator is or any of that has nothing to do with it. All my time in the military. Yes. Uh, let's see. I had Colin Powell. I, I, I had, uh, uh, I have Colin Powell? No, I don't think I was in with, uh, with in State Department. With, it was Condoleezza Rice. I, State Department was Condoleezza Rice. 
um, I think. And then I, I don't know if she lasted. I think there was somebody else who took her. And then Hillary Clinton took over. And then um, I don't know if I, John, uh, John Kerry, I'm not sure if he was um, in when I was there. Like, honestly, you just didn't know. Like, it was kind of, um, you were just doing your job. Like you didn't really think of who was the president or secretary of state. Um, you know, my, the, the ambassador had a very uh, big influence and the, uh, uh, the, the Rio, uh, the regional, the, the, the RO regional officer, regional ambassador, I forget what it is, but for region area, those guys, those are the people that really had a big influence on, on us in our job. And so um, a lot of times when you hear a lot of chest thumping from military folks and you give them a lot of value because of their military service, that they obviously know what they're talking about in politics. Don't, don't let that be a, don't let that be a, a shortcut to somebody saying I'm a retired Colonel and this because of that. Don't, don't let that, they are citizens just like everybody else. And sure. You may have seen like a, an over abundance of certain uh, you know, military folks for a certain party. Um, but that's not the entire story. That's not it by me. The military is a representation of the population of the United States, pretty much. Um, the number of, of race, gender, everything pretty much matches one-to-one -one with the entire population of the United States. So it's pretty much, as far as demographically goes, it's pretty much the same. So, just some people tend to get themselves a big headline because of their, you know, they, they use the military as a, as a shortcut for, you know, trying to get you to give them more power, uh, you know, mental power, uh, because they were in the military, but that's, it's really not, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Um, you're only hearing a loud person. Um, so anyway, uh, those are some books that I found to be useful. Um, Churchill stuff is really good, I think. Um, what else is good? Lincoln. Lincoln did some really good. I, I, I've got some Lincoln's books. Um, I study a lot of Roman history, Stoicism. Oh, uh, A Secret War with Iran. That's something I'm reading right now. <clears throat> Anyway, all right, well, was that useful? Let's see if I crushed the market by my little speech. <laughs> oh, I bounced the market. I think one other thing, uh, Thomas, is, um, you know, having, being able to take in a bunch of different sources of, of, news. Twitter is pretty good at that. Um, there, there are some good open source intelligence uh, accounts that I follow on, on Twitter. But again, they're going to tell you, a lot of them are going to give you the why or why this is important, which is not useful, right? Like Walter Bloomberg, his little Twitter account is a pretty decent example of, he just says this happens. And then of course you get a zero hedge, which retweets it. And then they give their commentary of it. And that's not useful. It is what it is. And it's your job to interpret, not, not your job to believe what Zero Hedge does. Zero Hedge is a great example of, um, of what not to believe. All right, any questions, folks? Well, I kept most of you here for the duration. I don't know if you're still awake, but if you are, I'll answer any questions you might have, thoughts you might have, um, or we'll, uh, we'll, get, we'll be done with the day. Seems like that's about it then.
Jonathan, sorry, I saw what you were saying. He was being facetious, I think. Rest of the world's Muppets to the US. <laughs> All right, guys. Ciao.